So hello again. Did you guys miss me? I thought so. Uh, welcome back to 1311 and we're going to do chapter 5 this afternoon which is Adlerian counseling. After uh, the kind of gloominess of Freud's determinism of, uh, of being locked into biological forces that we can't understand and that we can't control uh, and being at the mercy of instincts that we can't understand and can't control, uh, being, uh, you know, kind of dictated by a nature that we don't understand and can't control, uh, we run into Alfred Adler, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, studied with him, uh, and they were colleagues for a while uh, prior to um, Adler's breaking away. And he uh, broke away from Freud because he developed some of his own theories about development. And uh, Freudian psychoanalysis just wasn't working for him anymore. And the key thing that separated him uh, are some some key things that separated him from uh, Dr. Freud and uh, from other uh, psychoanalytical people at the time was Adler rejected the idea that the people that he worked with were sick people. Uh, he did not view his clients as sick. He viewed his clients as having made some uh, errors in their lives, as having uh, held uh, some mistaken beliefs and some faulty assumptions that were holding them back. And because they were mistakes in logic, because they were mistakes in applications, uh, the clients failed to, um, uh, to accomplish what they had hoped to accomplish and were therefore discouraged. So clients that, come to, that came to see uh, uh, Alfred Adler, in his estimation, were not sick people. They were uh, needing treatment. They were discouraged people needing encouragement. And that's a big part. Uh, in fact, that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, a nutshell encapsulation of what uh, Adler's motivation was with his approach, with this approach to counseling. So we're going to go uh, exploring around in there. And I'm going to share my screen with you again so that we can look at a PowerPoint here. Uh, aren't those great? Uh, incredible lot of work, by the way. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, there we go. Uh, let me get up here to my slideshow so we can move through it in an orderly fashion. Uh, one thing about Adlerian uh uh, counseling I need to uh, touch from Jump Street and that's uh, moving into this Adlerian therapy uh, takes into account intentionality and humanism uh, and humanism expands on the notion of the animalistic aspects of uh, human beings uh, you know we're we may be animals but we're rational animals and we're not at the mercy of our instincts as long as we have our minds and that's Alfred having a cigarette uh, in his office you know how unpolitically correct huh uh, but Alfred Adler is the key uh, theorists this associated with this approach to counseling and rightfully so since it's named for him but there are others like John D. Carlson who uh, was an American and uh, James Robert Bitter also an American uh, and uh, the late John D. Carlson he died uh, several years ago three years ago I think and uh, Dr. Bitter is still with us uh, but these are American practitioners. Adler himself uh, was uh, uh, a uh, contemporary of Freud's and more than just his uh, bent toward psychology and the theories he was developing and things like that because Adler was also Viennese. He, uh, uh, he was Austrian and he uh, uh, was also Jewish. Uh, so... Uh, like Freud, he experienced a whole lot of anti-Semitism uh, uh, for that reason, and uh, uh, that colored his approach to life, and 
he also is interesting. If 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 you're um, reading uh, the textbook along with me, uh, they have little biographical profiles in the front of the book, and I don't want to open it right now. So you, you know you can do it. Turn to chapter five, and the first things you see in there after the learning uh, uh, outcomes is uh, uh, bi biographies uh, regarding uh, the, the theorists that are involved, uh, Bitter and, and uh, uh, Alder, uh, uh, and Adler. Ugh, I'm fumbling over my tongue. Too many lectures over the last couple of days. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, that'll tell you a little bit about uh, about uh, the the theorist. And one of the things that you will discover as you read that uh, is where, b because of the backgrounds of some of the theorists, uh, you can see. And, and even say to yourself, oh, well, I see where he's coming from now because he had this experience, this is his influence in his theories. And that's certainly true. In the case of Adler, Adler was a sickly child. One of his brothers uh, got ill and died. It wasn't unusual for families to, to lose members like that around the turn of the century uh, of the 19th, 20th century. The 19th century, uh, it was uh, fairly common for uh, families to lose children. And, uh, you know, they would die in typhus epidemics and yellow fever epidemics and uh, the flu and all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, and childhood illnesses that we've fairly well conquered to die. So uh, Adler lost his brother, and that had a hell of an effect on him. As, uh, he became real cognizant of his mortality real fast at an early age. Uh, and when his brother died, he was very morose. And uh, Adler uh, had uh, uh, had one one of his teachers told his father that that Alfred was lost, that he just, you know, that he, he wasn't, that, that they couldn't save him, basically. Not in terms of being alive, but in terms of educating him. In fact, he suggested that uh, uh, Adler the Elder, Alfred's father, uh, uh, you know, apprentice him out to a cobbler or something, so he could learn how to make shoes, so he could feed himself as he grew as he grew older. Uh, and this uh, kind of motivated young Alfred to uh, to, to um, accomplish something. He wasn't a good student; he was a sickly kid. Uh, but he um, was told that he couldn't do something, and he decided, by God, yes, he would too. Uh, and so he, um, you know, excelled uh, from that point. He uh, grew up, went to college, went to university, became a physician, became a doctor, became a psychoanalyst. Uh, he also served in uh, 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 the medical corps. Uh, uh, he worked uh, as, a, as a physician and for a while, uh, like uh, uh, like uh, Frederick Pearls, uh, he uh, he was uh, uh, worked on a a Krankentrager, <laughs> an ambulance uh, hauling wounded soldiers away, and he worked with uh, uh, soldiers who had suffered psychological uh, distress during World War uh, One. He was a very patriotic fellow, so it had to be injurious to him when uh, uh, immediately after the war, uh, you know, the, the fascists began to blame the Jews for, uh, uh, for Germany being in the war in the first place and how the Jews had betrayed Germany and caused them to lose the war. And it was pretty hateful stuff uh, that was going on at the time. Uh, so uh, Adler, being a sensitive kind of guy, had his feelings hurt a lot. And you can see where he could come up 
uh, with some of his theories about discouragement and encouragement and mistaken beliefs and faulty assumptions and this sort of thing. And that ties into the key concepts that we're looking at here. A, key, a, a, a big thing uh, for Adler is that human behavior is purposeful and it's goal-oriented. It doesn't happen because an instinct snuck up on you and slapped you. Uh, and the instinct may have something to do with the purpose and what, why you're doing what you do, but human beings never ever do anything just because. That's, you know, <laughs> the, it, it, we're not determined by uh, biology. We're not determined by instincts. We have brains. We have minds, and we we do things. Uh, and uh, we make mistakes too in our logic and and uh, the way we try to decide things. And so we get we get off base sometimes. But we still. Uh, have that element that's within our power to control and our power to utilize. He also came up with the notion of Gemeinschaftsgefühl. Uh, and Gemeinschaftsgefühl is basically uh, uh, enlightened social interest. Human beings, as far as Adler is concerned, uh, we're herd animals, and we are. Uh, and we organize ourselves into groups. We organize ourselves into families and clubs and communities and and you name it. We, you know, uh, religions, political parties, uh, you name it. We we organize into that. And part of uh, what's important to us when we're growing up is being a part of something instead of being apart from it. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, this is a key concept that he takes into consideration in terms of human development, behavior, personality, etc. Uh, his approach to counseling is a phenomenological approach to counseling. Uh, and uh, phenomenology and, uh, uh, is uh, the world as we experience. It's our subjective life. And for Adler, that is the most important life that we have. And just between you and me, he's absolutely 110% right on that. Uh, it is my world that I walk around in every day, my reality that I interpret every day, my information and how I understand that information that drives my decisions that I make every day, my friendships, my family uh, relationships, my connections, my interpretations, and that's the world that I live in and is most important to me. I'm not a selfish person, I don't think I am anyway, uh, and I can step outside of myself and try to take a, uh, try to look at things from another person's point of view, but even that's phenomenological because when you're telling me things about you, I'm interpreting it through the lenses that I have to interpret it with. And so it becomes phenomenological to me. There are two worlds. There's the phenomenal and the noumenal. The subjective world that I interpret day to day is the phenomenological world. The noumenal world is things as they really are, real reality. And I don't understand that because I'm, uh, I'm part of it. And I don't have the intellectual uh, capacities to understand part of it. And we'll talk about that uh, a little later and the difference between the phenomenal and the noumenal. There are three life tasks that Adler uh, uh, identified that drive uh, who we are, that drive us in our development as we learn to master these tasks because part of what uh, we're moving forward with in terms of human development is the ability uh, to, uh, uh, to attain superiority or mastery over a certain aspect of our lives and not inferiority. And when I talk about superiority uh, and inferiority, I'm not talking about, that's not a value judgment. That's a measurement of can I do it? or not? Am I able to function uh, well in this area? Uh, family constellation becomes important for uh, uh, Adler. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, that 
when you look at a family, when you uh, are an organization, when you look at an organization, anywhere you have groups of people, uh, uh, you can see that there are organizing principles and predictable relationships that exist within uh, that group of people that basically let you know what they're going to be doing next. It becomes predictable in terms of their relationship and behavior. Birth order and sibling rivalry. This is uh, this is Adlerian stuff. This this isn't Freud or Jung or any of those. This is Adler's thing. Uh, every child in a family, you and me and brothers and sisters and all of that stuff, each of us have a different set of parents. We do. Uh, because parents change through experience too. Uh, Billy Bob and Peggy Sue fall in love and get married and they're perfectly okay in that relationship with one another. That's the marital subset. And then uh, along comes Billy Bob Jr. Uh, and now there's a new addition to the family, and that's uh, that's and, and they learn from uh, raising that child, so that when the second child, Peggy Sue Jr., comes along, then they've had experience with Billy Bob. But Peggy Sue's of a different gender, and <laughs> so birth order, sibling rivalry. We'll talk about that uh, here in a little bit too, because these are key concepts. Uh, and learning outcomes that I want you to have to, uh, because this will help you understand how Adlerian counseling fits into what we do as uh, uh, addiction pra practitioners. Uh, early recollections are important for Adler because they're part of, uh, of his assessment process and understanding the lifestyles of the of uh, individuals and their fa uh, to understand the lifestyles of individuals, you have to understand the relationships that they have. Behavior does not occur in a vacuum; it occurs in a context. I'll talk about that later on. But uh, early recollections uh, help us to determine what's important because the things that I put into my recollections uh, are uh, things that stick out to me, that are important to me for one thing or another. And why I remember them or why I remember them the way I remember them uh, becomes important in counseling. Uh, we'll talk about the practice of Adlerian counseling. Uh, and uh, Adlerian counselors are uh, much more open than a Freudian counselor was. And this was another bone of contention between Adler and Freud. Uh, Freud wanted to maintain that distance, professional uh, aloofness uh, that helped him to establish a transference neurosis with his clients so that he could get see how they respond to authority, basically, and, and uh, make determinations of that. Adler says that's not really important. He would rather be as equal as he possibly can with his clients uh, and, and on a friendly uh, basis with them, you know, that they have a cordial relationship with one another. It's not, you don't have to. If you trust one another, you're still going to get somewhere with Adlerian counseling. It's just easier to spend time with people if you like one another, right? Uh, and then an application of Adlerian principles and how that uh, basically goes across uh, the, uh, uh, the spectrum. One of the things that you, that, uh, uh, you learn right away with Adlerian counseling is human beings never any, ever do anything just because, right? So I went over these key concepts with you. Why did I do that, you think? Yep, absolutely, uh, because I learned in, uh, uh, that uh, uh, in Famous Teaching School 101 uh, that when you do a presentation like this, a very useful strategy with students, and this will be good for you to, uh, to remember too, because when you're putting together presentations for your groups or, or in the community or whatever, uh, first you tell them what you're going to teach them. That's what I just did. Then I teach you. That's what I'm doing now. 
And when we get to the end, I will tell you what I taught you. Tell, tell your audience what you're going to teach them, teach them, and then tell them what you taught them. Boom. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, human beings never, ever do anything just because. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we are informed by our instincts. We do do things impulsively. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, you do things that seems like a good idea at a time. Or you may uh, do something and think, what in the hell was I thinking? <laughs> you know, how, how did that even come into my mind to do something like this? Uh, those are good questions to ask yourself because human beings never, ever do anything just because. We've got a purpose. Uh, we're attempting to do something. We're shooting for an outcome. We're manipulating the environment. Uh, uh, you know, all human communication is manipulation. I'm trying to get you to accept certain information uh, from me and to think about it and, you know, incorporate it into your practices. We'll see how that works moving forward. But there's always a goal in mind. I want something. And the thing I want may be to get you to shut up, to go away and leave me alone, uh, to not hit me in the eye anymore, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a positive thing. And manipulation in this uh, context is not a bad word. People manipulate their environments all the time uh, and the people around them. When I say, please shut the window, that's a manipulation, is it not? I knew you thought so. Human behavior occurs in context. It's virtually impossible to understand human behavior apart from context. So quick story. But mom... Why do we cut the ends off ham when we cook it, says the little girl to her mother. Because she's watching her mother cook a ham, and mom cook, cuts the ends off and sets them off to one side. Uh, and she tells her daughter, well, honey, that's just how you cook ham. You cut the ends off and you set it off to the side where you can use them, to cut them up later and put them in your beans. Uh, and then you put your seasoning on the ham and you, uh, everything you're going to garnish it with. You set your oven temperature to this, set your timer to that, slam it in, and boom. And uh, when the timer goes off, you've got a ham for uh, a Sunday dinner. And so the little girl said, oh, and she accepted that and went on about her business because she's a good daughter, huh? Uh, and then... Uh, uh, but mom is bothered because she doesn't really know why they cut the ends off of the ham. So she goes uh, and calls her mother and says, Ma, why do we cut the ends off the ham when we cook it? And her mother says, uh, that's just the way you cook ham, honey. Well, that's the way we've always cooked ham. You cut the ends off, you set it off to the side, cut it up later, put it in the beans. Uh, put all the garnish on the ham, set the temperature, set the timer, him. Uh, but you know, it bothered Grandma too. <laughs> you know? uh, and so she saddled up and went down to the nursing home where her mother lived, see great grandma. And she went in there and she said, Ma, why do we cut the ends off of the ham when we cook it? And her mother said, Habit. When I married your father, I didn't have a pan big enough to cook the ham in. I had to cut the ends off of it to make it fit into the pan. Moral of the story, three, four generations ago, this behavior occurred in the context of necessity. If you wanted to bake the ham, you had to cut the ends off of it to get it into the pot, slide it in. Three generations after that, you're just cutting the, ha uh, the ham uh, ends off of the ham because you've got plenty of room and plenty of pot to put the, uh, to put the ham in. Maybe along the way, too, they discovered that ham tastes great in a pot of beans. <laughs> so uh, there's pragmatism involved in that. But behavior makes sense in the context in which it originates. Sometimes when that behavior becomes historical, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to cut the ends off the ham if you've got a pot that it'll fit in. You know, you, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, 
Uh, we learn about manipulating our environment, by the way. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Adlerians will do, and one of the things that we'll do even if we're not Adlerians and we're good practitioners, is we're going to see in systems, with individuals, in marriages, within families, within schools, within societies, we're going to see people doing things with good intent, with an outcome in mind that they're hoping to, uh, to, to rectify a situation, to make something bad turn into something good, uh, to get people out of trouble, whatever it is that they're doing. But when you get right down to it, that behavior is not being successful. It's not getting them to where they're uh, to where they want to go. And when you're doing something that doesn't work over and over and over again, uh, uh, particularly in a family system, you've fallen into a redundancy principle. And uh, uh, you'll, uh, this is a cliche. I use it a lot. When all you have in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem that you see. Uh, looks like a nail because all you have is a hammer. Uh, and so uh, you're really limited in the um, options that you have for that, for that reason. So if we're going to help people uh, do reality testing and, and think about their situations and think about what they want and the best way to get it and things like that, then we're going to help them to identify maladaptive behaviors such as drinking and drugging and raging and cheating and all the bad things that people do in their systems. Um, and we're going to help them identify that as, mal as maladaptive behavior and then help them identify more adaptive behavior that will be better suited to getting them the outcome that they want out of this. Doesn't that sound simple? Piece of cake, huh? I had a friend from Germany who never quite got that down. She said, piece of cookie. <laughs> anyway, Gemeinschaftsgefühl. Uh, Gemeinschaftsgefühl is a big word. I'm not going to ask you to spell it. Uh, but if you wanted to, there it is. Uh, Gemeinschaftsgefühl is basically a, a social interest, and it's an overriding social interest. Human beings are herd animals, like we said a while ago. We organize ourselves into units all the time. You know, we partner up with people. We, uh, that, it's human nature to do that. Uh, for people who don't have contacts, who don't exist in contacts of relationship, who don't have friends that they hang out with, who don't uh, have these interactions, they're, um, that's odd. And we view them as odd people. Something is wrong with those folks, right? Uh, we make judgments about them. Humans want connection to other humans. And some humans are stymied in their uh, uh, ability to do that. I've seen, uh, you know, there are people who have uh, social disorders, if you will, who they, they want desperately to connect with other people, but they don't know how. Uh, and they've been unsuccessful with it. Humans, even, um, you know, maybe the most damaged humans, uh, still are interested in other humans. We're attracted to one another. We're drawn to one another. And I don't mean, uh, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, sexually want to date kind of thing. Uh, but I see people... And I hear people, uh, and I'm around people, and I think, man, I just like to hang out with those people. You know, I want to, uh, I've, I've got friends that I really look forward to getting, uh, uh, you know, to, to hooking up with, to getting with, spending time with, uh, because they're intriguing people. And uh, I get excited about, uh, you know, talking to them and listening to them and things like that. Humans want to be a part of something rather than be apart from it. Uh, and sometimes that's a good thing uh, and sometimes that's a not so good thing because we can sell ourselves out a lot doing that too. Again, from an Adlerian perspective, I want to encourage my clients' insight into how they're connecting with people and what's important to them, what's important in their relationship. I want that social interest to be a powerful motivation for change. 
and I'm and I always get what I want in that because social interest is always a powerful motivation for change. Uh, but I want it channeled in a positive way. You know, I want it and people thinking about what they can do to make the world better, what they can do to make society better, stuff like that. Not uh, getting high because a friend wants them to get high with them, you know, which is a, a, a powerful motivation too on the on the other end. We'll talk about government chefs could feel a little more. Inferiority ver versus superiority in the world of the subjective. I'm moving too fast, aren't I? Let me slow down and take a breath. Inferiority versus superiority in the world of the subjective. Again, I don't want to imply by inferiority, I mean that uh, uh, an individual is less than I am or by saying superiority that an individual is more than I am. Uh, I don't want to do those types of measurements. What I'm talking about with inferiority and superiority is a subjective uh, measure. I look at myself and the things that I'm doing, I'm trying to put an online class together and I, and I get frustrated and I step back and go, man, I'm such an ignorant piece of shit. I cannot do this. This is too hard for me. I can't manage it. Yada, yada, whine, cry, bitch, bellow, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I do not want to feel inferior in that manner. There's a payoff in it for me, but I don't want that's not what I'm shooting for. I want to be superior. I want to master the task that I have to task uh, that I have to master to be successful in the in the endeavors that I've chosen uh, in my work world, in my recreational world, in my social world, in my religious world, in every world that I've got. And there are plenty of worlds, and we all live on different ones, man. But uh, uh, I want to be a master of the tasks that I, that I have to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is a short form to the serenity prayer. Those of you who are in recovery know what I'm talking about with the serenity prayer, right? God grant me the serenity uh, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's, 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 a, that's a good one. Uh, I did the short form for most of my life. Screw it. You know, kick it in the ass, go on to something else. Uh, that's a recipe for chaos and unhappiness, by the way. So let me uh, caution you on that. The subjectivity of the world is uh, how I see things. And I organize reality by my judgment and how I see things. The phenomenal world and the noumenal world uh, are different worlds. There are conditions sufficient for reality, and there are definitions, way for me, ways for me uh, to, uh, uh, to structure the things that I encounter in my life that make sense to me uh, and that help me to make sense with other people. For instance, Howard, I'm glad you asked, right here. See all those people around the tree? I don't really know why they're there or what they're looking at, but I'm going to assume for a minute that there's a squirrel up in that tree. Boy, they're all over my backyard, and I, I get to see them every day doing weird stuff. Uh, and if you are a squirrel observer, you know that when they decide to hide from you, they will run up in the tree and then they'll run around the tree uh, so that if you walk around the tree to see them, they'll walk around the tree uh, to keep the tree between you so that you can't see them. Uh, you know, you don't get behind them. So the squirrel's in the tree and we see the squirrel up in the tree. We saw him run up there. We know he's there. He didn't run down. He didn't jump to another tree. He's in that tree. Uh, so here's the question. I walk around that tree a couple of times and I can't see that squirrel. I know he's up in the tree, but I can't see him. I can't get behind him. So here's the question. I walked around the tree 
but did I go around the squirrel? Da 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 da. Bink. Uh, the answer is, uh, if you go around the tree, yes, you go around the squirrel because the squirrel's in the tree. And if that's what you're talking about, do you go around the squirrel? Yes, absolutely, you do. But if you go around the tree, does that mean you get behind the squirrel? That you get around where you can see the squirrel? That you wind up on the same side of the tree? No, it doesn't, because the squirrel moves so that you can't do that. Condition sufficient for reality. Sometimes we have to redefine what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this is particularly true if you're trying to help people discern outcomes that they want for changes that they're trying to make in their life and methodologies uh, to, uh, to achieve those changes. If you, uh, you can't get 25 years sobriety in six months. You just can't do it. Uh, although a friend of mine made a tape <laughs> a long time ago, pyramid of sobriety, come on in and get your desire chip. When you've got 90 days, you can start recruiting other people. And every time they get 90 days, that 90 days goes on to your sobriety. So you too can be 20 years sober in 18 months. <laughs> Uh, ta da da, you know, a little bizarre, huh? But uh, uh, one foot in front of the others, uh, defining and redefining your reality as you go along. Uh, then there's the concept of fictional finalism, which is another important aspect of uh, of uh, Adlerian uh, theory. Uh, there's a me way out there, maybe up on this top of the mountain. That's the me that I want to be. But I don't really know quite how to be him. I mean, uh, he doesn't exist. He's not real. Other than in my mind and my goals and my imagination and how I, how, how I want to turn out. And all my life, I'm going up this hill to get there, to be this guy. Uh, and he's out there somewhere. That's the me that I want to be someday. Uh, and all of my uh, lifestyle reveals this guy. Uh, and it's a, it's a model that I'm shooting for, a pattern that I'm shooting for. Uh, and you have it too. You'll be okay if. You'll be okay when. Uh, when you got this degree, got that job, got this spouse, got the 3.2 kids, got the house in the suburbs, got the 501k, uh, you know, uh, your candidates in office, uh, people want you uh, to head up their committees, uh, you know, you they want you to be a deacon in the church, whatever it is, you know, you're out there somewhere, and there are things that are important to you along the way. And these things that are important to you along the way help me when I'm working with you and when I'm talking to you uh, to understand uh, basically uh, uh, what your lifestyle's about, where you're going, what your goals are, how you want to be, etc. And if I'm doing that, then maybe I can help you uh, understand what your fictional finalized self is about too. Sounds pretty good, huh? How many of us have goals that are unrealistic? I know I do. I've had plenty of them. Uh, I've had goals that are unattainable. I've had plenty of them. Uh, you know, I can tell myself that if I put my mind to it, I can do anything. But you know what? I can't. And neither can you. <laughs> you know? But there are some things that if we put our minds to, we can excel. We can absolutely excel at. Uh, and there are things, and there are things that energize us, that make us excited, that you know fill, fill us with possibilities, uh, and um, you know we we invest in them. And there are other things that we think, well, I don't really like this, but the pay is good. I don't really want to do that, but it might sure make my dad happy. You know these kinds of thoughts out there. 
Uh, and this is kind of a sell out into inauthenticity because I'm not doing what I want when I'm doing that and I'm not doing what's important to me when I'm doing that. Fictional finalism is the me that I want to be. And I'm out there somewhere and I'm going to go looking for it. Birth order and sibling rivalry. Uh, I bet old Adler, when he was putting that together, didn't ever think there'd be a TV show about his theories, but there was. Here's the story of a lovely lady who was busy, uh, uh, who was bringing up through very lovely girls. Remember those? All of them had hair of gold like their mother's, youngest one in curls. And here's the story of a man named Brady who was busy with three boys of his own. They were four men living all together, but they were all alone. Till the one day when this lady met this fellow, and we knew it was more than a hunch that this group would someday form a family, and that's how we became the Brady Bunch. I've listened to that theme song so many times <laughs> in my life, uh, and I've watched every episode of the Brady Bunch also, uh, because that's how it was with television back in the day. That, that song, by the way, and this is FYI, in case you're playing Trivial Pursuit sometime, was, an, uh, it was, literally, was a terrific summary that prepared people to watch the show. If you heard the song, you knew exactly what the plot was for, for if you uh, jumped in on any episode. It's the story of a lovely lady with three lovely girls who met this guy uh, with three sons, and they were four men all together, and they were alone till they got together, and that's how we became the Brady Bunch. Now, Alfred Adler said that uh, uh, for the first child, firstborn child, uh, he has a set of parents, or she has a set of parents that uh, uh, we're we're new to we're new to being parents. We don't know what to do. Uh, and we parent that child in one way. Then a second one comes along that has their own personality, and we parent that child a different way. And then the third one comes along, and now we're more experienced as parents, and this child has his own personality too, and we uh, uh, parent that child another way. Adler defined that there were birth order characteristics that associated to where you were born in a family. It's in your book. You can read it. Uh, and his uh, uh, descriptions of the characteristics of the firstborn, the secondborn, the thirdborn, the fourth, fourthborn are, are very spot on uh, for, for Western society families. A problem is this family became a blended family. There was This was a family over here and a family over here, and they got together and boom. Uh, now, both of these were widows, uh, uh, widowers. She, uh, uh, Carol Brady lost her husband. Mike Brady lost his wife. Uh, because of the time that this show premiered in the United States of America, that had to happen. They couldn't be divorced or anything like that. That was scandalous. But if you're... Uh, spouse was croaked, that was fine. And it was all about power and, uh, in the family and how power is deployed in the family, which is what birth order and sibling rivalry is really about. Uh, these two were oldest children. Greg was oldest child to Mike and, and the Brady family. And uh, Marsha was the oldest child to Carol in uh, her original family. I can't remember what the original last names were uh, for the kids, uh, for, the, for this side of the family. Uh, uh, and Jan was second born, and then there was Peter, and then uh, uh, Cindy was the third born, and then there was Bobby. Uh, and so that's how... Uh, they were. These guys had a hierarchy already. They had an operational role. These girls had a hierarchy already. They had operational roles. Then when we all became the Brady Bunch, there was internecine war uh, between all of these little guys here 
who are trying to redefine themselves in a, in a system that's been blown apart and reassembled. And here's the story of a lovely lady. Uh, this created a family constellation. And Adler is the uh, guy who came along and says, this really plays a huge role in who we are as individuals. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, the, who we are as members of a family informs who we are as individuals. Members of the family exist in predictable relationships to one another. Uh, and um, uh, because it's like looking at the stars, if you, uh, you know, look at Calliope or uh, Orion the Hunter or Sagittarius or Scorpio or the Big Dipper or Aries or whatever, uh, the stars are in a pattern. And they're, they're, uh, stars exist in elliptical orbits uh, out there, and there are heavenly bodies and systems that exist in elliptical or orbits, which uh, causes them to spread to a certain degree. But uh, if you understand the positions of the stars in making determinations of uh, the, these patterns, these constellations, Ptolemy, the Egyptian, looked up in the sky and he saw Capricorn and he could tell you in the days before Christ where uh, uh, Capricorn would be uh, in uh, uh, September of 2020. Uh, not in the United States of America because he didn't know there was a place such as North America. He knew nothing of that. Uh, but he knew this heavens and he knew that because he knew the relationships of those stars, he could predict where they're going to be at any time. Role behavior is prescribed in this. We do things that help us to fit in in our family. Sometimes these role behaviors are, uh, like I said, they're, they're adopted as means and methods by me because I'm thinking it's the best way to get me through uh, this system that's... Uh, screwed up as a soup sandwich. Uh, and other times I'm kind of nudged or manipulated or forced into these roles by the powers that be in that system. And that would be uh, parents, siblings, you know, what have you. Relationships and behavior in that system are guided by organizational principles. And the organizational principles uh, uh, help to maintain a balance in the system, a predictability in the system, uh, but the organizational principles may uh, and behaviors may not be very adaptive. Uh, uh, you know, we have to have someone in the system who's screwed up. We have to have someone in the system who's drunk because that's the way the rest of us can function. Uh, and we'll, you'll learn a lot more about that in Dr. Kaufman's family class, but... Um, so uh, there are organizational principles that guide the system. If I'm working with an individual and I get information, I do a, a, a behavioral assessment on them and I do a lifestyle assessment on them, I get an idea of what's important to them in terms of their fictional finalized idea of themselves and what they're moving toward, but I also get an idea of how they got to be who they are because of where they came from. And that's the family, and the relationships in the family organize that. When you're talking about this kind of stuff, you're talking about identity. And remember, uh, when, when you're a child, you don't self-identify. Other people identify you. They're scripting you. You're not writing your own script, and you're getting... Uh, your script from family members, from parents, teachers, that kind of thing. And the way they respond to you is telling you, you know, how you're doing, you know, uh, uh, that, kind, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm formed by my relationships in the family. And if you just casually ask someone to identify themselves, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who, who are you? Who are you really? Um, 
Well, you know, I am uh, uh, I'm uh, a teacher. I'll tell you what I do. Uh, I'm a Texan. I'll tell you where I live. Uh, I'm married. Uh, tell you my relationship status. I'm a father. I have kids. Uh, you know, and the, uh, the the words that we use to describe ourselves are relationship words. If I tell you I'm a son, what do you know about me? You know I have parents. You know I have a mom and dad. Uh, if I tell you I'm a sibling, if I tell you I'm a big brother, you know I have little brothers, right? If I tell you that I'm divorced, you know that I had another relationship at one time. If I tell you I'm a widow, you know uh, that uh, uh, you know that um, I've lost a spouse. And we, uh, we do that all the time. Uh, Brenda Chenoweth in the TV series uh, uh, Six Feet Under said one time, there's no name for people who've lost a child. Uh, and those of us who've been in that circumstance understand uh, there's no name for a a person who's lost a child. That's just too effing horrible to consider. <laughs> you know? uh, so, uh, but otherwise, we define ourselves. These are terminologies that we, that we use to let people know who we are. And they imply relationship, and they imply behaviors. Family rules and roles are reflected in emergent lifestyles. As we talk to people, uh, and get a picture of where they came from, uh, what their parents were like, what their family was like that they, uh, you know, that they grew up in. Uh, then I get ideas. That, th then I, I get explanations that answer, uh, uh, that inform me. Uh, and if I'm doing it for myself, if I'm looking at my own, then I can explain to you how I see myself, how I see others, how I see the world how I think I should behave, how I should expect you to behave. Uh, what's important becomes a theme in that lifestyle and it recurs over and over. And I see that my personality is a construct and I see that my identity of myself is a construct uh, started by someone else but ongoing by me. And maybe this someone else, when they started constructing me and started formulating me, maybe they didn't do a real good job. Maybe they were trying. Maybe somewhere down the line, I made mistakes. Maybe I misinterpreted the message that they were trying to give me, and I got off base in that. And I formed myself uh, a system of private logic. And my private logic may be based on a mistaken interpretation. It, I could have a mistaken belief about who I am. And if I organize my behavior, my life, my goals, my uh, activities, my relationships, etc., around a false concept, then I can expect to have problems with that relationship because it wasn't based on a, a real reality or it wasn't based on the reality that I assigned it. That's a better way of, uh, of putting that. Change the way I look at things and I have changed the world. Wanted, dead and alive, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, that's a quantum physics joke. Uh, some of you are kind of chuckling out there because you know what Schrodinger's cat's about. Uh, it's a thought exercise, and it came up in a discussion of quantum physics about matter and how something can be and not be at the same time. It can simultaneously exist and not exist. And Schrodinger's cat uh, wasn't a real cat, thank goodness, poor kitty, uh, but uh, they... Um, uh, Schrodinger's cat, you put it in a steel box and you break a vial inside that box and that box has uh, material in it and it could be an activated uh, uh, radioactive substance and it could be a not activated substance that has the potential to be radioactive. And depending on whether the sub, uh, substance is active or not, it will kill the cat. Uh, of course, if you leave the cat in there for a couple of weeks, it'll probably die anyway. 
Uh, but as long as the box is closed and we don't know the status of the uh, potentially toxic material that's in there, then we don't know the status of the cat. The cat is dead and alive simultaneously. The cat is nothing until someone opens the box and looks at it. And then when the observer looks at the cat, he changes reality, or she changes reality. I'm not being sexist here. We change reality when we, uh, when we uh, look. Uh, is matter a particle a wave or a wave? Again, quantum physics is neither in both simultaneously, depending on who's looking and when. The meaning of life, you did, bet you didn't think you were getting that out of here, were you? And unlike the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the meaning of life is not 42. The meaning of life is living it. Adler said that there are three major life tasks that if, that if we're going to be successful human beings, we've got to master, we've got to, get, we've got to be good at this. We've got to find a way to make this happen for ourselves. The first one is building friendships. It's a social task. We need people. People need us. We need the interaction. We need the connections. We need the shared interest. We need the, uh, we need everything. We need the acceptance, the socialization, the good times, the bad times. We need friends. The second task is establishing intimacy. This is a love or a marriage task, you know? Uh, and I'm not gonna, I, I'm not, even about defining that. I don't care if it's uh, monogamous relationships, polygamous, polyandrous, doesn't matter to me. Straight, gay, don't care. Uh, the goal is establishing intimacy, love tasks, marriage tasks, commitment tasks, sharing tasks. This is real big. Uh, for human beings. We've been working at it and working at it and working at it since the dawn of time, right? And then the third task, and this is uh, again an important one uh, for Adler, is contributing to society. Uh, you know, giving something back, doing something that uh, is satisfying to us in terms of occupation or in terms of uh, creativity in terms of, uh, uh, just in terms of being there, design, man, you know? Uh, and uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing well with, uh, with my uh, uh, contributing so to society, and I'm doing well with establishing intimacy, and that doesn't mean doing it perfectly. Intimacy is uh, being able to uh, be in a room with someone and be comfortable if you're sitting on each end of the couch and not saying a word. Intimacy is having the trust in the relationship to argue, sometimes very vociferously with someone that you're involved with, uh, without ri risk of losing them because it's not a conditional relationship. Uh, these types of things, if we're good at that, and if we're good at building friendships, and you know, most of the time, people are considering what I get out of friendships, but it's also what I bring to the table uh, that strengthens these relationships. Those are the tasks that if I'm good at, I'm probably going to get through this life in a relatively satisfied way. And that's something to shoot for. Uh, we'll talk about that some more. Uh, and the coming chapter on existentialism where they make a big deal about that. Uh, substance use disorders, they do exist in family systems, as do other mental uh, and uh, emotional disorders. Apples don't fall far from the trees. Chips fly off the old block. He is his father's son. She is her mother's daughter. All crows under heaven are black, you know? Uh, we make these observations about people, uh, and this is kind of a shorthand way of saying that uh, uh, we recognize that there are uh, systemic realities 
that exist in families and societies. You know, you can't trust uh, 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 people from uh, the mountains. Uh, you can't trust people from the valleys. You can't trust people from the east or the west. Uh, we kind of divide out like that and make judgments. And sometimes those judgments aren't true. When we're looking at family systems, we can look at things where they are absolutely true, however. And uh, substance use disorders exist in family systems. So do other mental emotional disorders. For Alfred Adler, even, uh, even though we bring these problems out of our uh, uh, family system, uh, even though we have basically contributed into our own pathologies, if you want to think about it uh, that way, uh, clients aren't sick when they get to Adler. Adler does not view his clients as sick. He says that the people who come to see him are simply discouraged. They have made uh, uh, mistakes in their life, in judgment. They have uh, created false logic for themselves because they have mistaken beliefs and faulty assumptions. Consequently, the role of the counselor is a collaborative role when, we, when we're working with these people. And I wear a lot of hats in there. Uh, four, of the, four of the big ones uh, is uh, a confidant uh, where, uh, you know, you can come to me with anything, a listener where I do not judge you and tell you you're screwed up and what you need to do to fix it. I just listen for the most part. Uh, a sounding board where you can bounce ideas off of me and see if uh, see what I think about them, and I can give you advice in that role. And as a teacher, uh, showing you how to do certain things and how to go about uh, uh, challenging your irrational beliefs, how to go about uh, you know uh, taking on your your uh, mistakes and logic, your uh, uh, false syllogisms, your mistaken syllogisms. Mistaken beliefs plus faulty assumptions equals a skewed private logic. And we have private logic, right, uh, that uh, makes sense to us. We believe it. In fact, we can take mistakes that I, I can make decisions when I'm 10 years old about how the world is, and I etch them into stone. And they're not good decisions even for a 10-year-old. But here, 50, 60 years of age, uh, I'm still clinging to a belief system or, a, or an assumption that I made when I was a child. And it didn't work then, and it's not working now. When Adler takes this humanistic view of, of challenging and, and making sure that there are conditions sufficient for the reality that I'm trying to live in now, then we see the birth of reality testing. And reality testing is something that goes across the board from here on out moving forward. Is that really the way it is? Is that really what you're trying to do when you do that? Is that really the motivation that you had uh, when you embarked on this? Is that really what you want from this relationship, etc.? Family constellations and early recollections are methods to help us gain insight into uh, uh, where we come from, where we fit in, what kind of input we got from the, uh, our caregivers and the people around us telling us how we're going to be. Uh, genograms helps me track behaviors in, in the family. And, and my genogram, and again, you'll learn more about this in the family class, uh, you get a clearer idea of what your family constellation is about. You get a, fa a, a clearer idea of where the behaviors, why we cut the ends off of the hams, where that came from how it originated, where it had a practical purpose, how effective is it good for us now, how good is it for us now, uh, health-wise, etc. Journaling and early recollections are, are, uh, uh, are uh, both effective, well, they're effective, 
They're scary. Uh, they can be emotional. Uh, I would say that most of the time, you know, sometimes you'll, uh, I was looking at something the other day and I found a picture of one of my granddaughters uh, who was cooling off down in Mexico in a bucket with a water hose. She had a big five gallon bucket and I had a bucket full of Mila in there and she had a water hose she was squirting on herself and she was having such a uh, wonderful time, you know, when you could tell she was laughing and happy and I had forgotten about that, you know. Uh, and then I run across something and I see that photo and it puts me back in that spot and I feel good. You know, I have, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a good memory. Now, Freud believed that we didn't, uh, uh, that we never forgot anything. We just sometimes didn't how to know how to recall it. And that's kind of a, uh, and Adler is still kind of following that line of thought with the journaling early recollections, writing them down. Now, here's the deal. When you write an early recollection down, you go back as far back as you can remember and begin writing that recollection. Just between you and I, most people, uh, uh, you know, we forget things. We uh, I'm not, not to take issue with Freud, I, or maybe I just don't know how to recall them, or I didn't file them in the important file in my memory or whatever. So I trip over something, and uh, it takes me back to where I was, and I refeel the feelings that I felt back then. I'm back in that uh, emotional state. I become nostalgic, or I become ashamed, or I become whatever, scared again, maybe. Uh, so when you're looking uh, to uh, tap back into early recollections, it can be frightening, you know, because people are going into areas. Most of the time, there are some things back there that we call uh, repressions. Remember, we talked about those ego defenses in the last chapter, and repression is pushing something out of your consciousness. Well, when you're doing journaling, it pulls it back into your consciousness. And repressed stuff in this uh, is in a in a hallway of your mind that says, uh, you know, warning, you know, no entry, authorized personnel only, forbidden. Uh, you know, you know it's there, and you know there's stuff there, and you make a concentrated effort to walk around it and not acknowledge it. But if you start journaling the things you remember at the earliest stage of your life, you open those doors, whether you wanted to or not. And so that the next thing you know, you're writing a whole bunch when you only meant to write a little bit. Uh, and sometimes it's traumatizing. Sometimes you discover that why you repress that. It wasn't because it made you feel good. If you are sitting here now listening to me and thinking, well, you know, I don't remember anything until the seventh grade. I don't know what happened before that. You know, I, I was just like, my earliest recollection is uh, I was counting change on my desk and wondering if I was going to have enough to get chocolate milk at lunch. That's what I remember. Uh, and I was in the seventh grade. Uh, that's probably not good news for you. Uh, if you have no earlier recollections than that, it's probably because it's repressed and you put things out of your awareness and you put it out of your awareness for safety's sake. You did that to protect yourself from unpleasant uh, memories and, and emotions and that kind of thing. When you start journaling early recollect, uh, recollections, then you learn things about the family of origin. You learn things about the individual. You learn things about relationships. You learn things. And that's uh, not only am I learning it, but what's even more important, what I learn is not important. What I get out of uh, your uh, journaling efforts is not important. What is important is your insight what you see, how you feel. Yeah, but Howard, what if I'm, uh, what if I'm doing this and uh, I'm not sure it's a memory? I mean, sometimes I'm, uh, when I go back into uh, uh, thinking about uh, memories, I'm not sure if this is something that I really remember myself or if it's something that someone told me and, I, and I, now I'm treating it like a memory. 
And my question, uh, my answer to that is, does it matter? If it feels like a memory to you, write it down. Uh, no one's going to haul you into court, you know, and, and sue you for having a, 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 you know, a fabricated memory. If it feels like a memory, write it down. Uh, if later on uh, you discover it's something someone told you, well, you know, you discover it was something someone told you, but uh, you know, treat it as a memory. Uh, and the more you write, the more you uh, bring out. And this is a technique that Adler used. Uh, when you're doing these memories and you're examining your belief system, uh, am I who I think I am? And how do I know? Uh, and uh, I get down to some core beliefs about myself. Uh, and I face some truths about myself along this process. Again, this is a, a consequential uh, to, uh, uh, to improved insight, to a greater degree of insight, uh, that when I question who I am and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and who I'm doing it with and all of these things, I have uh, greater insight. It leads me to... An, uh, uh, to uh, uh, discoveries about myself, uh, really, and uh, leads me to uh, examining my core beliefs of what's real and what's important and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so here's some uh, core beliefs of uh, substance use disorder clients, and these are pretty common core beliefs. It's, it's not universal to everyone, but they're common. Uh, the first is I'm basically flawed. There's something wrong with me. There's something missing. There's something broken. And I know that. I'm not real sure what it is, but I know it's there. If you really knew me, you'd reject me. So I can't let you know. <laughs> I can't let you know that stuff. I can't let you know who I really am. I don't want you to know there's something wrong with me, that there's something missing, that there's something broken. Uh, because, it, you know, the relationship wouldn't uh, withstand it. Because of this, I cannot rely on others to meet my needs. I can't be on a level with them. I can't open myself up to them. What if I what if I did? What if I told you? What if I laid it all on the table and said, this is me. This is who I am. This is, uh, there it is, all of it. And you say, oh no, that'll never do. <laughs> you know, uh, I can't have you in my life. Uh, yeah, where's that leave me if I give you everything and you say that ain't good enough? You know, uh, possibility is it? Says he with a question mark. My drug of choice is my most important need. It never lets me down. Uh, I can deal with all this other stuff as long as I can get high and forget about it. I can deal with all of this other stuff as long as I can medicate it. Uh, well, do people think that way? What do you think? Uh, pretty common thinking with drug addicts. It leads us to flawed syllogisms. My syllogism may be, I'm basically unlovable. This is out of the book. The world is full of people who are likely to be rejecting. Therefore, I must keep to myself so I won't be hurt. Make sense? Make sense, is it true? No, more likely, you know, there are some people, you know, I have some unlovable characteristics about me, but, uh, you know, I'm worth something, too. You know, I have some good qualities. And there are people out there who uh, will reject me, certainly. Uh, but there are people out there who won't, either. They'll accept me, and they'll care for me. I, I, I hazard to say they'll even love me. Uh, so I don't necessarily have to keep to myself so I won't be hurt. And if I keep to myself so I won't be hurt, I might keep myself out of uh, uh, relationships and uh, uh, friendships and acquaintanceships and, you know, whatever else ships out there uh, that might otherwise be fulfilling to me. Uh, if I uh, try to avoid my pain, chances are pretty good I'll also avoid my joy because they come up out of the same well in the same bucket. You can't have one without the other. Or I might come up with something that's totally outrageous. 
Socrates is a man. Socrates is homosexual. Therefore, all men are homosexual, right? No, not right. <laughs> but Socrates is a man. Socrates is homosexual. Therefore, uh, 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 all men are homosexual is a classic syllogism that's put together in a correct ma manner, uh, but it leads to a false conclusion. And we can do that all the time. And you see it all the time with people. So, Adlerian, in a nutshell, what do you do with people when they come to see you? You establish the proper therapeutic relationship. I make sure that they're there for something that I can deliver and that I can deliver what they're there for. Uh, and we meet in a collaborative manner. I try to keep things as equal as it possibly can. Uh, and we define what kind of things we want to uh, uh, work on. In order to define what we're going to work on, we have to explore the psychological dynamics operating in the client. We have to see where they're coming from. Uh, and it's more important for them to see where they're coming from than it is for me. I mean, I may be interested and it's useful to me and what I'm going to be doing with you and all of that kind of good stuff, but what's most important in an exploration of the psycholo uh, psychological dynamics is what you learn about you, not what I learn about you. And when I'm doing that and getting a better understanding of where you may have made uh, come to false conclusions or made uh, errors in judgment or something like that, I can encourage uh, uh, you to question the decisions that you've made, the actions that you've taken. Uh, I can and, and encourage in a real sense is to give you the courage to do things that you haven't done before. Encouragement is disillusionment in a way, uh, and I mean that in the most positive sense. Disillusion sounds like a negative thing, but disillusion is to move you away from illusion and into a reality that's consistent with who you are. Encouragement is to cause you to be able to do things that you're not quite, you know, sure that you want to do, that you may be afraid of. Courage, dear hearts, is not an absence of fear. Courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. That's what courage is. It takes no courage to do something you're not afraid of, Nishvara. Uh, so uh, the, the fear is an element of the courage. And to help the client make new choices. Uh, when you come in uh, to AI, when you go into treatment, when you, uh, uh, you know, uh, answer the call to glory and walk down to the head of the church to get baptized to the front of the church. Uh, you know, you're making commitments to lifestyle alterations. You're uh, making a commitment to a new way of being, making a commitment to, uh, uh, to a new reality. And that's scary. Uh, also, you're, uh, uh, you know, you're giving up some things. And when you're changing, and this is, this is something we need to consider when we're talking about uh, encouraging clients and supporting clients and things like that. When we're asking them to make changes, this is heavy stuff uh, because making changes, uh, leaving an old way of being, giving up old habits, I mean, giving up my drug, it, it, it's like turning my back on an old friend and it hurts on one level. It, and I grieve it on another level. It, it's, it's giving up an old friend that's constantly, uh, you know, stabbing me in the back and stealing my cookies and doing mean things to me, but it's still something that's been with me a long time. And when I'm making these big changes in who I am, it's a little bit like dying because even though a new me is emerging and it's a better me, I'm losing that old me that I've always been. And it's a sad thing in a lot of uh, circumstances. Conclusion. The Adlerian approach is a phenomenological approach uh, that places importance upon the subjective uh, world of the client and the experiences of the client. 
We'll talk about this a lot more in, uh, uh, in, in uh, ensuing chapters as we go along in this course, but we'll talk about it more in basic counseling skills. We'll talk about it more in family. We'll talk about it more uh, in uh, assessments uh, because it's important. Uh, the, this phenomenological approach is what the client's experiencing and how they're seeing it. This their reality. It's not mine to call. You know, uh, I'm going to assist them in re-examining that reality as they move forward. But it is theirs, and they know more about their world than I do. So, uh, Adlerians believe that the client is discouraged. Uh, and not sick, and that their lives and their conditions, their circumstances can be greatly improved uh, through insight into uh, mistaken beliefs and faulty assumptions. So consequently, uh, counselors work with the client to help them develop the, the uh, ability to um, identify and challenge faulty thinking and behavior. Uh, very important is that the Adlerian approach is collaborative and the counselor and the client uh, uh, basically negotiate a contract and agree on the behavior to change and how to change it. And once that's complete, uh, so is counseling. And you can move on down the road once you're satisfied with what we, uh, that we've resolved, what we set to resolve. Adlerian counselor, uh, counseling is very user-friendly. Uh, and uh, to both the counselor and the client because, you know, there's a lot of education, interchanging, dialectics uh, going on between us uh, that, uh, you know, we try to keep uh, uh, as threat levels to a minimal in that. And so elements of this approach are evident all the way across the field. They're, they're also very abundant in the treatment field. So you see... Uh, these uh, uh, counsel, the counseling and uh, and uh, techniques of Adlerians um, everywhere. Boy, that was a sudden stop, wasn't it? Wonder we didn't get whiplash. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I hope this was edifying and helpful to you in your reading. Uh, and um, I'll see you again in Chapter 6. What do you say? Bye.